We greet all of you tonight in the name of the Lord, thankful that you're with us. We appreciate those of you on live stream who have joined us as well. Pray that this evening will be a profitable one to you as well. We're in the book of Genesis. This will be our 78th lesson. We're drawing to a close of this uh, book. We're going to be in chapter 48, verses 8 through 22. Genesis 48, 8 through 22. Joseph is standing before Jacob with his two sons. And Israel beheld Joseph's sons and said, Who are these? And Joseph said unto his father, They are my sons, whom God hath given me in this place. And he said, Bring them, I pray thee, unto me, and I will bless them. Now the eyes of Israel were dim for age, so that he could not see. And he brought them near to him, and he kissed them and embraced them. And Israel said unto Joseph, I had not thought to see thy face. And lo, God has showed me also thy seed. And Joseph brought them out from between his knees, and he bowed himself with his face to the earth. And Joseph took them both, Ephraim in his right hand, toward Israel's left hand, and Manasseh in his left hand, toward Israel's right hand, and brought them near to him. And Israel stretched out his right hand and laid it upon Ephraim's head, who was the younger, and his left hand upon Manasseh's head guiding his hands wittingly. For Manasseh was the firstborn, and he blessed Joseph and said, God before whom my fathers Abraham and Isaac did walk, the God which fed me all, the, all my life long unto this day, the angel which redeemed me from all evil, bless the lads. And let my name be named upon them, and the name of my fathers, Abraham and Isaac. Let them grow into a multitude in the midst of the earth. <clears throat> and when Joseph saw that his father laid his right hand upon the head of Ephraim, it displeased him, and he held up his father's hand to remove it from Ephraim's head unto Manasseh's head. And Joseph said unto his father, Not so, my father. For this is the firstborn, put thy right hand upon his head. And his father refused and said, I know it, my son, I know it. He also shall become a people, and he shall also be great. But truly his younger brother shall be greater than he, and his seed shall become a multitude of nations. And he blessed them that day, saying, and thee shall Israel bless, saying, God make thee as Ephraim and as Manasseh. And he set Ephraim before Manasseh. And Israel said unto Joseph, Behold, I die. But God shall be with you and bring you again into the land of your fathers. Moreover, I have given to thee one portion above thy brethren, which I took out of the hand of the Amorite with my sword and with my bow. Amen. One of the great uh, preliminary death scenes of Scripture. I would like to say a word before I begin on how thankful I am that I was raised up to be acquainted with death. <clears throat> my parents never kept me from death. I went to every funeral they went to. And he went to a lot of them. In those days, a lot of people seemed to die. 
So I wasn't afraid of death. I faced it all the time. And I'm grateful, very grateful for that. Some people do their children a great disservice by being so busy with life, they never face death. And this, uh, this is not right. Your children should face the whole panorama of life that they can handle, and, and death is one of them. Now, as I'm dealing with this text tonight, I wanted to say a few uh, preliminary words about the providence of God because I, when I was raised up I heard this word a lot providence of God but nobody ever said what it meant no body I heard preachers say it and they just assumed everybody knew what it meant I heard teachers say it nobody knew what it meant they said, well that's the providence of God if someone said something about a miracle, they'd say, well, that was the providence of God. I, so I thought, well, I don't want our brethren to be ignorant about that word. It's, the word's not found in the Bible, but the activity is providence. What, what exactly is providence? Well, the English word means divine guidance or care. God conceived as a power sustaining and guiding human destiny. <laughs> That's it. That's pretty potent just itself. And I gave you some of the theological definitions of providence because it's a subject that Bible dictionaries and things like that deal with it because it's all through the Bible. But providence ties together the purpose of God, sovereignty of God, and the holiness of God, Amen. and it involves the foreknowledge of God and the predestination or election of God. Amen. All these are tied up in providence. No wonder they didn't tell us what it meant. <clears throat> Boiled down to its essence, providence means God is carrying out his own purpose. Yes. He's intervening in the affairs of men. The Bible tells you over and over and over and over again mm -hmm. that God interjected into the society of men, that God in inserted himself right. into history. Most of the time he wasn't asked to do it. Yeah, that's right. Amen. But he did it. So why the church has so much trouble with this mm -hmm. tells you where it's at way off away from God someplace. I'm going to say this and say it boldly and I could support this in a public setting. I make no mistake about it. That a person that has providence, that's trouble with providence, election, predestination, foreknowledge is not close to God. Let me say it another way. They're unacquainted with God. Yeah, yeah. Let me say it another way. They don't know God. Mm -hmm. Now, there were some people in Corinth. They were genuinely converted people. Mm -hmm. But Paul said, some among your number do not know God. They have not the knowledge of God. I say this to your shame. So there were some, there were some people in Corinth, the 8th chapter of 1 Corinthians deals with it, that didn't know there was one God. Yeah in the church that was full of spiritual gifts, they didn't know there was one God. They lacked acquaintance with God. All religious controversy stems from a lack of acquaintance with God. All of it. Every bit of it. All misunderstanding of Scripture stems from a lack of acquaintance with God. Now, I'm not condemning it where that exists. What I'm saying is people have to know that when you don't know much about God, it's because you don't know God. <laughs> That's why. And when you realize knowing God's eternal life, you see the gravity of this, of this situation. So now I've made this affirmation that the providence of God is held up. The foundation is God's purpose, what he's carrying out. God's purpose is what he's doing, not what you want him to do. 
It's what he's doing. Not what you've asked him to do. It's what he's mm -hmm. purposed to do. In order to carry this purpose this out, he has to have a purpose. He has to focus on it. Mm -hmm. He has to be sovereign over everything. Mm -hmm. And he has to be holy mm -hmm. in all of his dealings. And that's what holds providence yes. up. Now let's find the book of Genesis. We've seen the providence of God in the calling, deliverance, and preservation of Noah and his family. You cannot account for that apart from God's working the thing out. You saw it in the calling, choosing, directing, safety, and increase of Abraham. The providence of God did all of that. The birth, the preference of, the choosing of, the guidance of, the protection of, and increase of Isaac. All demonstrated the providence of God. The birth, preference of, choosing of, direction of, protection of, provision for, and the increase of Jacob. He, this wasn't a large nation that outnumbered everybody. Sometimes this was like a lone family in a hostile world. And they lived to a ripe old age. Yeah, yeah something. That's God's providence. See, where it worked. Yeah. The birth and the preference for and choosing, the protection, the direction, the exaltation of Joseph. That was all God's providence. The will and hand of God were on all these people. He was working out in them what he wanted worked out. You can account for their willingness. God can make people willing in the day of his power. In fact, you'll never find a key figure in Scripture that becomes involved in God's w against His will. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's right. They're always, a, before they ever get involved, they're willing. Mm -hmm. Saul of Tarsus, before he ever got to step yeah. one, he was yeah. willing. That's, right. See, yeah. that's how it all starts out. So you find an unwilling people, they're not even, they're not even at the starting line. Yes. They may attend a church, they may be professed Christians, they may even know the Bible. But they're not willing, they're not even at the starting line yet. Yeah. That's how you begin. Mm -hmm. Everybody in Scripture, when they saw the issue, said, what should we do? Yes, what do you want me to do? Yeah. See, they were all, all of them. What was that? was God's providence that led them to that Amen. position. Now, as I mentioned, God's providence is closely related to his foreknowledge and his mm -hmm. predestination and election. And if anyone has a right to do what he wants, isn't it God? Does any, would anyone be willing to affirm that God doesn't have a right to do what he wants, and yet you want a right to do what you want? The only reason you, have, you want to do what you want is because you're in the divine image. Yes, that's, right. Amen. that's why you got that quality. Mm -hmm. The difference between you and God is he can do what he wants. Amen. You can just want to do it. That's, yeah. oh, that's the, until he intervenes, you, it just doesn't get done. The things that happened to Noah and Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and Joseph could not possibly have taken place if God wasn't in the in matter. There's no way any of those things could have taken place. Later, Moses will affirm that all these things were true of Moses, Aaron, the Levitical priesthood, and the nation of Israel as well. You can only account for their choice, for their, for their involvement in the purpose of God, for their assignment of what they were to do, for their protection, for providing for them. You can only account for it mm -hmm. by God's, shall we say, providence, which is a general word that gathers all these divine traits up together. Now, with that in mind, let's proceed with our text. See, God's in all of this. Uh -huh. We're not reading about things that just happened. These things happened to them for our learning. Amen. Amen. They were caused mm -hmm. to happen. Yes. And Israel beheld Joseph's sons and said, Who, who, who are these? <clears throat> he looked that way, could make out just a kind of an outline evidently of them. Ooh. Now, he said he knew Joseph had two sons because in the fifth verse, he mentioned them and he knew their names, mm -hmm. who they were. But he, he couldn't recognize them. He, who, who are these? The text says he beheld, I mean, he, he, he focused on them, but he couldn't, he couldn't see them. 
clearly, for his vision was failing. <clears throat> These are the two sons that, of whom Joseph's, Joseph has, he knew Joseph had, but Ephraim and Manasseh, which were born unto thee in the land of Egypt. That's what Jacob said he knew. I know these are, these are your sons, Ephraim and Manasseh, were born unto thee in the land of Egypt. I said, Ephraim, he said this at verse 5. Yeah, uh -huh. Ephraim, mm -hmm. he wasn't the firstborn. Yeah. Ephraim and Manasseh, see, all right, already. Yeah. <laughs> God has opened his mouth and he's, he's, he's naming them in a proper order. Even though Manasseh was the firstborn. Who are these? <clears throat> now there's a as an application of this to spiritual life. Sometimes we're faced with truth that's difficult to comprehend. Mm -hmm. You say, What's this what's this mean? Mm -hmm. What what is this saying? See? This is a common experience for people that are serious about the Lord. This was apparently the manner of the youthful Jesus. Because he's 12 years old, he had some questions. He wasn't omniscient. He was not omniscient. Yeah. At 12 years of age, he had some questions. So he's anxious to get to Jerusalem, uh -huh. seek out the doctors of the law, the experts in scriptures. See, he wanted to bring these to me. It's like saying, bring these scriptures to me. As it, when he was 12, well, if, if your children at 12 years old aren't doing something similar, well, you got to get to work. Yeah. you got to get to work. Some of them, they ask questions before that. Uh -huh. That's a good sign. Mm -hmm. What I'm showing here is the mold of people that walk by faith are like this. What they don't see, they want explained. What they can't understand, they inquire about it. Just like youthful Jesus. And he asked questions. They were astonished at his understanding and in his answers. He asked questions that uh, show he had some understanding. So this is a comely trait, trait that Jesus had. It's not common in our day. And I know of no youth ministry that actually focuses on producing children like this. No, shall I recognize youth ministry. I don't know of any college course that teaches the people youth ministers that they graduate with a youth minister's degree. I don't know of any college that teaches the children to be like this. If you do, well, God bless them. We're formed. Don't make no mistake about it. We're forming anybody that does it. I'm just saying this is in common. I'm saying you can't build a career on this. Yeah. You can't build an institution on this. Mm -hmm. You can't make a name for yourself by doing this. And so everything, every aspect of the kingdom of God is like this. You cannot exploit yeah, amen. for amen. personal benefit what God does. Amen. You can't do it. Yeah. It's designed that way. Yeah. It's designed so if you ever see it right, God gets the glory. Yeah. If you can't see it, it's just you just can't see it. That's all. <clears throat> well, Je Joseph answers. He says, "There, there, they're my sons." Now, listen. Now, Joseph for 22 years has not been around a Jew for 22 years, and yet he didn't forget where these boys came from. Yeah, that's right. Amen. Hmm. Some people forget where their children come from in church. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. They forget where their children came from. Mm -hmm. Not Joseph. He said, they're my sons whom God has given me in this place. Yeah. Who would have thought it? In this place. Already with the boy standing there, Jacob has testified to God's appearances to him. And what God said to him, these boys heard this testimony. See, I'm showing you here that godly people talk about God and the things of God and what God's done. This is a subject of conversation. He didn't say, now listen, we had a famine in Egypt. You, I mean, it was really some famine. You ought to have seen it. And, but I was able, 
I was able to distribute the card, tell him all about what happened during the famine. He tells Jacob what happened. He had God gave him two sons. It happened. It was before the fam before the famine. These boys were born, so they got to live during plenty and during famine. They had quite a wide experience. Do you remember what Joseph said when these boys were born? When Manasseh was born, he said. He hath made me forget all my toil and all my father's house. <laughs> Some of the firstborn, that's what he says. The second was born, he said, God has caused me to be fruitful in the land of my affliction. He traced the birth of those boys who was through a daughter of a heathen priest. He traced it back to God. After he'd not been in the land of the Lord for 22 years, after he hadn't been around any Jew for 22 years, he had no copy of the scriptures. All he has is what happened to him. That's, that's it. And the memory of what his father taught him. That, that's all he had, but he didn't forget it. Amen. He knew where these boys came from Amen. and that they were like a, some relief yes. sent to him. Because it was hard on Joseph living in Egypt at first. Mm -hmm. Difficult experience. But these boys made up. Ah, that's how God can do that. Now God can do that. God can give you an experience that'll just make you forget all the bad, Amen. all the bad stuff. All of a sudden, it just passes away. Yeah. That's God for you. Mm -hmm. And we covet that kind of blessing for people. Knowing this, when you know this, ask God to do this for some people you know that are going through difficult times. Yeah. Ask, ask Him to give them some relief. Send them some comfort. Mm -hmm. Give them a blessing. They're my sons. That's who they are. There's something to be learned here. As I mentioned, God will give you a blessing to offset the effects of hard experiences. Now, following the Babylonian captivity, Ezra confessed that this is what God was doing. He was giving them some relief mm -hmm. from this captivity, Babylonian captivity. Here's what he said, Ezra 9, 8. Now for a little space, grace has been showed us from the Lord our God to give us a remnant to escape and to give us a nail in his holy place that our God may lighten our eyes and give us a little reviving in our bondage. Oh, God can do this, let me tell you. God can do this. He can give you a little reviving during these low periods when maybe thoughts are coursing through your mind and you have some challenging things you're facing and things are falling through the wall, so to speak, ground, falling to the ground, so to speak. And, but he can give you a little reviving. It's, uh, what a little reviving will do, it will do a lot. Amen. It may be a little quantitatively, but effectively it's a whole lot. Mm -hmm. A little reviving our bodies. And notice what he said this little reviving consisted of. He'll show us grace. <laughs> There's nothing quite as like the spiritual rejuvenation that grace brings. Amen. Amen. Just you just mm -hmm. I, I experience this almost every morning. It gives me a little grace. Mm -hmm. You have a pretty soon you I I say, you know, this is another one of those days, Lord. I I don't feel like very productive today. So give me a little just a little grace. Just a little grace. Mm -hmm. Just a little grace. He'll do that. A little grace will revive you. And, of course, Amen. he doesn't give it to you a, a little measures. It's exceeding abundant yeah. that he gives you grace. And when he gives it this exceeding abundant grace, 1 Timothy 1.14 says it's exceeding abundant with faith and love. So when grace comes, there's a couple of things in the bag of grace that you need. Faith mm -hmm. and love. <laughs> so do they come from God? Well, yeah, mm -hmm. they sure do. Show us grace, and he'll leave us a remnant to escape. <laughs> Whether we're speaking of a, the church as a whole or individual believers, the fiercest of trials, there's an escape route out of them. Yeah, amen. So that the whole person is not devoured. The whole church mm -hmm. isn't devoured. Mm -hmm. Give us a remnant to escape. There's some things Satan can't touch that you got. Yeah, amen. 
Why, well, it seems like he's touching everything sometimes. He's oh, this way down deep inside. There's something Satan can't touch. Whatsoever is born of God, the wicked one touches him not. That's what the scriptures say. Amen. Gave us a remedy, and he gave us a nail in the holy place. Something to hang in the holy place. Uh, Jesus is called a nail, you know, by Isaiah. Here's his prophecy about the Messiah. Mm -hmm. I will fasten him as a nail in a sure place. And he shall be for a glorious throne to his father's house. They shall hang upon him all the glory of his father's house, the offspring and the issue, all the vessels of small quantity, from the vessels of cups, even to all the flag vessels of flagons. Everything's going to be suspended on this mm -hmm. nail. Which nail is, was, is Christ? Mm -hmm. It's going to spend all the glory. Mm -hmm. All the people. Mm -hmm. Then he goes on to say, in that day, saith the Lord of hosts, shall the nail that is fastened in the sure place be removed and be cut down and fall. And the burden that was upon it shall be cut off, for the Lord has spoken it. Now this depicts the taking away the sins of the world. All the people were hung on him. All the glory was hung on him. But then it's sort of an independent act. All the sins of the world were hung on Christ. There he was. Then he cut off the nail. Amen. And when Jesus died, sins went. <laughs> they were gone into an uninhabitable land. Praise the Lord. And then he said, you'll lighten our eyes. This is what the little grace. You'll lighten our eyes as what happened physically to Jonathan when his King Saul told him nobody should eat or drink till we destroyed the Philistines. And Jonathan, his son, didn't know he said that. And so he was walking through this and here's this wooded area and the honey's dropping off the trees all it's all over the ground just so he dips his rod in it and his eyes were enlightened he was refreshed he rejuvenated and when when they fellow citizens told him you oh, you're in trouble now he said oh dad my father didn't do right to look look at my eyes i put my rod in this and look what it did to me you know during times of trial i've had this experience God will give you to see something about God, something about his purpose that will undo everything you've been experienced. Mm -hmm. And invariably someone will say, well, that's not, I don't know that that's the right interpretation. <laughs> I mean, we got a free will. We know that man has created a free moral agent. Even though the Bible nowhere says that. Yeah, that's right. Nowhere does it say that. But then that's your test. Oh, I don't know. I don't know. Maybe you, you may think I shouldn't believe this, but look what it's done to me. Amen. That's what God does. See, this is what God does. He, it's what he did to Joseph. He gave him a little reviving in his bondage, see. Give us a little reviving, a little relief. Now, I will say that these things we've just talked about are not easy to learn. It took a long time for some of us before this kind of was cleared up to us. A lot of dirt had been thrown in our eyes. Sometimes the people I followed were like leaving a dust cloud. They were like the old country roads we used to drive on, you know, you see a cloud, just, <laughs> cloud of dust. You look down the road and say, someone's coming down there a couple of miles. I can see the cloud of dust down there. Well, theologically that happens. There's some people, it's a cloud of dust follows them wherever they go obscures. That's not how God operates. God enlightens eyes. Well, he can close eyes too, but that's with people that are unwilling and not devoted. <clears throat> By divine intention, God can disrupt disquietude. Yeah. God can disrupt sorrow. He can do it. God can disrupt a feeling of helplessness and a feeling of futility and a feeling that you're good for nothing. Mm -hmm. God can revive you. Amen. So, wait a minute. If I can use a jackass, I can use you. Mm -hmm. yeah. Oh, that's kind of crude, but sometimes you just have to think about it. God can use a raven. Yeah. Uh -huh. He can use you. Mm -hmm. See? God gave them to me, and where did he give them to you, 
Joseph, in this place. Yeah. <laughs> in this place. They were in Egypt. That's where he got his sons, these two sons. 22 years in Egypt. The first 30, he was a single man. The first 13, he was a single man. Remember? And Pharaoh gave him his wife. Now I know there. I I personally know of a lot of young people that in four years of college forgot God. Why know some others one year on the job? They forgot God. In this place, Joseph didn't forget God. He didn't have a Bible. There wasn't any prophet there. There weren't any other Jews there. His father didn't visit once in a while to tune up his understanding. He had perfect, he was perfectly clear about this. Now, how, how clear should you be about what God's done for you? How, how clear should it be to you living on this side of the cross? How God's blessed you. And when, if you name all some things that are grievous, well, I could, we could match you. I, I probably could match you per, item for item on bad stuff that's happened to me. But that's not what you ought to, that's not what you want to uh -huh. chronicle. He didn't say, well, you know, Dad, <laughs> when I got here, this woman I was working for, her, she, she lied against me. I went to prison for 13 years, and uh, the stocks hurt my feet. Huh? He didn't breathe a word of that. I don't know if Joseph ever, if Jacob ever did know that. Uh -huh. But he, if he did, it's only because Joseph told him he was exalted. He told him what God had done to him while he was there, while I was away from home, isolated from the family. God gave me these two boys. Amen. And you know how he raised them. Uh -huh. It's a wonderful truth to see, isn't it? Amen. In that domain, Joseph knew where his sons came from. The Egyptian domain. Now this provided a witness to succeeding generations that those who were raised in the faith can survive. Mm -hmm. Amen. You believe this. We don't know what lies ahead for our children. One of our children, well I've had two of my children who have gone on, they outran me. One of our children passed through a health crisis that we had no idea this had ever happened. We went into the crisis. We came out of the crisis. God is with us all along. That's what Joseph is testifying. See, God, God is with me. See, I had these two sons in that domain where there were no kindred spirits and no semblance of revealed religion. But that environment didn't overcome Joseph. He overcame it. So I call upon you, overcome your environment. Amen. Amen. Yes, amen. Overcome. If it, there's some part of your environment that, yeah. that you would like to have another way. I understand. Overcome it. Yeah. And Jacob's, now he's not going to talk as a grandfather. These are his grandchildren by flesh, but he's not going to talk about Grandchildren. He's not going to conduct himself as a grandfather. Yeah, that's right. He's going to step now into the role of a patriarch and a prophet. Amen. He says, bring them to me, I pray thee, and I will bless them. Uh, now, I, I have had the privilege of being blessed by several people, even when I was at a young age. Some people haven't had that blessing. But it is, it is a blessing to be blessed by a seasoned veteran of the faith. Bring him to me now, bring him, bring him to me. I'm going to bless him. But, but they're going to get the blessing, though, they have to, they have to come. Yeah, right. <laughs> you got to get him close to me if, mm -hmm. if I'm going to bless him. Now, this is no ordinary blessing. He's not going to pray for, like, their safety and that they'll have a lot of good offspring and plenty to eat. And that's not the kind of blessing he's going to pray of them. 
even though that is not excluded, understand, but that's not going to be his focus. Now, if you trace the scriptural records of the patriarchs plus Joseph, you will not find them emphasizing the mundane ever, ever. There's no record of it. Ordinary family life, you have no idea what their ordinary family life was even like. It's not mentioned. They had an ordinary family life just like you do. But it's not, it's not mentioned. Because they live their lives conscious of God, conscious of the promise of God, conscious of in the, pre, in the future inhabiting the land of Canaan, conscious of what God had promised Abraham. They lived with this uppermost in their mind. It goes without saying that all of life is to be centered in Christ. Every bit of it. Whether you're working on your some personal project or in the kitchen or on a job or whatever. You do it for the Lord. If you're a cook, cook the meal for Jesus. Cook the kind of meal you'd serve Jesus. You're building something, build something that you'd be willing to give to Jesus. Huh? Taking care of someone's financial books, take care of them like you're taking care of Jesus' treasure. Yeah. Uh -huh. Treasury. That's how you live, see, for him. That, this is how, I say this because this is how these men lived yeah. for God. Now, there's another application here that sticks out to me. As, as Jacob brought his sons to, as Joseph brought his sons to Jacob, Jesus brings us to God. <laughs> In fact, that Peter says he is put to death in the flesh, but quickened in the spirit, that he might bring us to God. Yes, you can't get to God without Jesus. Amen. No man cometh to the Father but by me. That's yeah. not speaking of a pronouncement of a, of a slogan uh -huh. or a formula. It's no man cometh to the Father but by me. <laughs> he leads you to the Father. Just like Jacob led his, son, like Joseph led his sons to Jacob. He did this because because Jacob he couldn't uh, he couldn't see, not clearly. There's a, there's such a thing as spiritual blindness too, where people can't see clearly. The psalmist said of the wicked, that God's judgments are far above out of their sight. Okay, just things that God are just plain too far away. They can't see them. So your role as a witnesser or testifier is to take what's intended, what God has intended for those kind of people to know, and bring it, yes, bring it into them. Amen. Well, Jacob uh, kissed the sons and embraced them. I can only imagine what joy must have filled his heart. He's thinking about the Abrahamic promise, and now it's extended beyond Joseph. See, now he knows it's going beyond, yes. beyond Joseph, who was beyond him. Now, Jacob didn't ask Joseph to bring him his son so he could hug him and kiss him. I mean, I understand. He wasn't as a grandfather yeah, that's right. doting over his grandchildren. It, that wasn't that. Although I don't, some of that was probably involved, I understand, but that is, he's thinking higher than that right now. And when he sees those boys, he said, you know, I'd not thought to see your face. I've been living all, ever, ever since that time when you disappeared, when you were 17, I never knew what happened. I thought you was killed. Never entered my mind that I'd actually see you. See, hope deferred makes the heart sick. Yes. But with Jacob, it wasn't hope deferred. He didn't have any hope. Yes, he sir. had no hope yeah. of ever seeing Joseph again. But Jacob had been wrong for 22 years. For 22 years, he'd been thinking wrong. Yes. But now he knows it. Mm. See, God's faithful. Amen. I'm telling you, brethren, mm. God's faithful. If you've been thinking wrong, and you live for God, God will show it to you. Amen. Yes. He'll straighten out your thinking. Amen. And 
his, his wrong thinking wasn't his That's fault. That's right. He had been led by his sons okay. to think That's wrong. Right. Yeah. That's right. Yeah. There's other people that people to Oh, yes, them. amen. Other, notice how Jacob traces these things. He said, I had not thought to see thy face, and lo, God, there it is again. These people can't talk long without talking about God. God has showed me also thy seed. See, they traced everything back to God. Now, this has been consistent all through the book of Genesis. Yeah. If you've been following it carefully, you'll see that every time they trace it back yeah. to God. God has showed me. Now, there's other people that uh, trace things back to God. Eve traced it back. I've gotten a man from the Lord. See, she traced it back. Abraham, he traced things back to God. Noah, uh -huh. he did. Melchizedek did. Told Abraham, God gave you this victory over those kings. Uh -huh. Rachel did. God been merciful to me when she had a child. Leah, she traced her children back to God. Jacob, Laban, Laban's daughters, Joseph, Joseph's brothers, they all traced things back to God. See, now this is what God was doing, is doing in these people he's developing. He's developing a people that will actually trace things back to him because mm -hmm. that's how he gets glory, see, yeah, amen. when it's traced back to God. Mm -hmm. If someone has a, 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 some success, some success in some endeavor and they trace it back to a program they'd enlisted in, oh, yeah. huh, that's what they do. They say it's this this program. Now God doesn't get glory for that. That's right. yep. uh -huh. Which means that program can't be from God. Yeah, amen. Yeah. Uh, well, what they do, they, 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 they give God credit that God worked through that program. Well, people have to be serious when they talk about the Lord. God works through Christ and through His Word, amen. period. See, a failure to detect the presence and influence of God betrays a lack of involvement with Him. Mm -hmm. yes. Only people involved with God are able to do this, yes. trace it back mm -hmm. to God. And notice something else, that He got more than He expected. Mm -hmm. I didn't think I'd see you. Here I see your sons more than, see, that's God. That's how God does. Yes. When you get something from God, it invariably is more than you expected. I didn't think it'd go this far, but it did. God's blessings continually transcend the expectation. Amen. Really good. It's a reminder of God is a rewarder of those who diligently seek Him. That's right. Mm -hmm. That's right. Well, Joseph, he... Uh, he brought them out from between his knees. And what is that? These boys are over 20 years yeah. old. Mm -hmm. These boys were born before the family. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So you got what remained of the plenty, seven mm -hmm. years of famine, and these intervening years. Mm -hmm. These, these, so these boys are they're over 20 years old. He brought it from between his knees. What? Well, it's not Joseph's knees. He's not talking about Joseph's knees. He's talking mm -hmm. about Jacob's knees. Mm -hmm. Here's the picture. He brought the sons to Jacob. He seated on the bed. Mm -hmm. He brought the sons to Jacob. He hugged him and kissed him. And now they're, mm. they're between his knees, making mm -hmm. the kneeling at the time. Mm -hmm. So he goes up and he takes, takes the boys from Jacob. Mm. He sees into the background and bowed himself. Mm -hmm. He's getting ready to present them officially. He, mm -hmm. he took them then, and I said officially, mm -hmm. yeah. bring them for the patriarchal mm -hmm. blessing. Mm -hmm. And he bows himself in, at the reverence of a son for you. Mm -hmm. Bows himself to the earth. Then he takes them both. He's, he's went, 
forward, took him away from Jacob. He brings him back, and he, he positions them deliberately. Mm -hmm. He takes them both, Ephraim mm -hmm. by in his right hand, mm -hmm. toward Israel's left hand, mm -hmm. and Manasseh in his left hand mm -hmm. is going to be toward Jacob's mm -hmm. right hand, so that the right hand, Manasseh, will get the blessing. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. Yeah. He's taking the firstborn, but he's yeah. going to mm -hmm. have the blessing. Now, I wanted to say a word about mm. biblical art, mm. historic biblical mm -hmm. art. Mm -hmm. It's only been in recent years that I have noticed this, mm. but almost all of it is wrong. Yeah. Yeah. Amen. Yeah. Uh -huh. <clears throat> If they don't have some little floating cherubs in it or something like that, it's almost always wrong. Mm -hmm. You may remember I showed you one with Noah. There were four men on the face of the earth. Mm -hmm. Noah, Ham, Shem, and Japheth. Uh -huh. Four men on the face of the earth, all there was. Mm -hmm. So this ancient artistic drawing had the three sons coming in facing Noah, where the Bible says they backed in. Mm -hmm. Facing Noah, and if you look out the window, there was a man hoeing in the garden outside. Mm -hmm. <laughs> now, I, I challenge you, I've examined a lot of historical biblical art, and you're, there's generally something wrong with it. Mm -hmm. I'm going to explain why. Mm -hmm. It's because they were living during times when the scriptures were not mm -hmm. available to the people. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Now, I did. So I gave you some documentation here so you'd know what some people in history, the conditions they've lived under. Mm. So you just know. 1229, under a synod, they forbade the laity to have in their possession any, any copy mm. of the books of the Old or New Testament except the Psalter. Mm. They said, We must strictly forbid these works in the vulgar tongue. Mm. The Senator of Tarragona said, they ordered all vernacular versions to be brought to the bishop to be burned. All the versions in the native tongue. Mm. James I renewed that decision. The Senate held there in 1317 under Bishop Ximenes prohibited the Bengards, Benguines, and Tertaries and the, of the Franciscans the possession of theological books in the vernacular. Mm. The order of James was reviewed by later kings and confirmed by Paul. They prohibited the translation of the Bible into the vernacular or the possession of such translations. In England, Wycliffe's Bible translation caused the resolution passed by the Third Synod of Oxford. <clears throat> no one shall henceforth of his own authority translate any text of scripture into English and no part of any such book or treatise composed in the time of John Wycliffe or later shall be read in public or private under pain of excommunication. Hmm. Well, I'll give you some more there, but a lot of your art is traced back mm -hmm. to that period of time. Yeah. Oh. Mm -hmm. And the people, these artists, didn't know the scriptural record. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. That's why they that's why there's a lot of imagination in your paintings. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's in fact, but in literature, then it came the Dark Ages. They called it the Dark Ages. Mm -hmm. Art was affected. Mm -hmm. Everything was affected by the Dark Ages. It permeated everything. When they took God out and the scriptures weren't known and this sort mm -hmm. of thing. And I will tell you that there's a different kind of taking away of the scriptures that's happened in our day. Yeah. So it's, uh -huh. a, it's of a different order. It's more subtle. Mm -hmm. The scriptures have been taken from the people in, so far as proclamation is concerned. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Everyone isn't a, is, isn't taken into this, understand? Mm -hmm. but, but the but the masses don't are not hearing scripture. Yeah, that's right. And it's, it has the same effect on them mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. that the withdrawal of the actual text yeah. had on the other people. Amen. They do and say things that are not right. That's uh -huh. right. Yep. But it's traced back to the lack of. Mm. Scriptural <laughs> understanding. I might add that our enemy has done this. Mm -hmm. Amen. Satan. Amen. So Joseph brings his sons to mm -hmm. Jacob and prepares them for the covenantal blessing. Mm -hmm. 
and Israel, which is Jacob, mm -hmm. because of Israel, because now he's acting as a patriarch mm -hmm. and prophet of Amen. God, mm -hmm. stretched out his right hand and laid it upon Ephraim's head, mm -hmm. who was the younger. Mm -hmm. And Ephraim was, Manasseh was the one standing before his right hand, mm -hmm. <laughs> laid it on Ephraim, who was the younger, was left hand upon Manasseh's head, guiding his hands wittingly, yeah. for Manasseh was the firstborn. Mm -hmm. So here he's faced with a physical circumstance that contradicts the purpose of God. Mm -hmm. There's a physical circumstance that yeah. contradicts the purpose of God. What are we going to do? Yeah, amen. I'll cross my hands. Mm -hmm. That was ingenious. No one says wittingly. That, mm -hmm. that was a brilliant mm -hmm. strategy. Remember now, this doesn't have to do with earthly circumstances. It isn't because he favored mm -hmm. Ephraim. It was because he knew. God had revealed to him. Ephraim. Amen, so yes. Ephraim is mm -hmm. going to be the mm -hmm. first, take the place of the firstborn. So he placed his hands on the son, son's head mm -hmm. and guided them wittingly. Mm -hmm. The other versions read this way. He guided them knowingly. Mm -hmm. So it wasn't like God made him do it. Mm -hmm. He knew what he was doing. Mm -hmm. He crossed his hands mm -hmm. on purpose. Hmm. He intentionally crossed his hands. He guided his hands intelligently. Mm -hmm. He directed his hands of purpose. He guided his hands crosswise. Hmm. And he did this purposely. See, that all the translations picked up on it. Mm -hmm. This was not done accidentally. Yeah. Uh -huh. This wasn't something that God just made him do this and he didn't realize what he'd done. Hmm. He knew what he was yeah. He knew what he was doing. Mm -hmm. Let's think about the circumstances. That's remarkable, isn't it? He was in communion as much as possible mm -hmm. during those limited times with God. So God, yeah. God made him know who it was to be. And he blessed Joseph. Interesting. He's blessing to somebody, blessed Joseph, mm -hmm. and said, God, before whom my fathers Abraham and Isaac did walk, the God which fed me all my life long unto, his, unto this day, the angel which redeemed me from all evil bless the lads and let my name be named upon them and the name of my fathers Abraham and Isaac and let them grow into a multitude in the midst of the earth. Now commencing with Abraham we read more about blessing than we did before. Up until Abraham just a few, just a few people were blessed in any sense, just a few people. Sarah was said to be blessed, Ishmael was, Isaac, Laban, Jacob, Potiphar's house. But the blessing was, you didn't read much about blessing. Those who were themselves blessed of God, they, they would bless others. The person who was blessed would bless somebody else. Melchizedek was one of those, uh, one of those persons. He was blessed by God. He blessed. He blessed someone else. Now he said uh, he was blessed by God. He says the angel which redeemed me. The angel which redeemed me. Now. Virtually every commentator that I read said that that was what they call a theophany. That was, that was God himself. Now I'm going to disagree with that and tell you why. The Amplified Bible uh, reads that way. Quote, the redeeming angel, that is the angel, the redeemer, not a created being, but the Lord himself. You see, they amplified, they added those, those words, that's not in the Bible, but that, they put their understanding there. Now I'm going to show you some, a couple, three examples of God said to be speaking, but he spoke through an angel. He didn't personally, it was through an angel. The first is the call of Moses, which, with which I'm sure you're familiar. An angel of the Lord appeared to him in a, in a flame of fire out of the midst of a bush. Mm -hmm. He looked, and behold, the bush burned with fire, and the bush was not consumed. Stephen refers back to that event. Mm -hmm. He says that an angel of the Lord in a flame of fire in a bush talked to, talked to Moses. 
And yet it says the same did God send. See, so God, God sent him, but he did it, as Stephen said, by the hand of an angel. Yeah. See, so God spoke, but it was through an angel. It wasn't, it wasn't deity in a visible form. Yeah. The leading of Israel to Canaan is another example of an angel said to do it, and yet it said that God did it. Behold, I send an angel before thee to keep thee in the way and to bring thee into the place which I have prepared. Beware of him, obey his voice, provoke him not, for he will not pardon your transgressions, for my name is on him. But if thou shalt indeed obey his voice and do all that I speak, then I will be an enemy unto thy adversary, enemies and an adversary to, unto thine adversaries. For mine angels shall go before thee and bring thee into the so forth. Then he said that the nations that the angels were going to drive out, God said, I will cut them off. So seriously, God said something and God did something, but he did it, said it, and did it through an angel. Now, there's a reason why God said this. He told Moses regarding his own presence, I will send an angel before thee. I will drive out the Canaanite, the Amorite, the Hittite, the Perizzite, the Hivite, the Jebusite into the land flowing with milk and honey. For I will not go up in the midst of thee. Not a stiff-necked people, lest I consume thee in the ways. Yeah. So he himself didn't go, but he, the angel, mm -hmm. which equated what the angel said was no different than God saying it yeah, directly to them. Now let's take a look at something else, the giving of the law. Exodus says, God, God spake all these words, saying, I am the Lord thy God, which have brought thee out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of bonds. Then he, then he articulates the Ten Commandments, Exodus 20. God spake all these words, is what it said. Stephen said of this event, who have received the law by the disposition of angels. Yeah. <laughs> See, this is how these men thought. They, they knew that God is never, never reduced to a messenger. Yeah, amen. Yeah. There's only one example in Scripture of deity becoming a messenger, and that's Jesus Christ. Amen. And deity never became a messenger before that. And he had to humble himself to he humbled himself to do that and divested himself of the prerogatives of deity. So when he was in the form of a man, he couldn't conduct himself as God could. He got tired, he got hungry, you know, and so forth. Paul said of it, Wherefore then serveth the law, it was added because of transgressions, till the seed should come, to whom the promise was made, and it was ordained by angels in the hand of a mediator. Again, he says, if the word, in Hebrews 2.2, 2, if the word spoken by angels, was, let's talk about the law, was steadfast. Now, why is it this way? Because God in his holiness cannot directly confront someone unlike himself. Well, he can, but he... It would do away with the person. Right. Here's what he revealed of himself to Moses. To the psalmist. A fire goeth before him and burneth up his enemies round about. So if God got close, just his, his direct person, uh -huh. it consumed whoever Amen. was Amen. different from him. For this reason God said to Moses, who had said, I want, show me thy glory. Uh -huh. He said, Thou canst not see my face, for there shall no man see me and live. Yeah, amen. And this angel Jacob talking about, he saw him. Mm -hmm. yeah. In fact, he wrestled with him. Yeah. John wrote, No man has seen God at any time. Mm -hmm. The only begotten, which is the, the bosom of the Father, hath declared him. It is said of deity who only hath immortality dwelling in the light which no man can approach, whom no man has seen, nor can see. So when he says an angel, the, he's not talking about God himself in a form. 
He's talking about an angel, a created angel that represented represented God. Now these just aren't mere technical technicalities. This is the way God is. For God, see, God doesn't have a form. He's a spirit. So for God to come in a form, this would involve condescension. And God won't do that. The Son volunteered. The Son did it. God didn't. The Son did it. And he, he held the Son up and directed him while he was here. said, the angel which redeemed me. All right, see how some versions talk about a redeeming angel. Some of the commentators say this was God, the redeeming angel. He's a redeemer. But the word redeem here is not used like it's used in Christ. Yeah, that's right. Here's, uh, and it's there, as it's used in this text here, redeem means to protect or to mm -hmm. deliver. It's not talking about redemption that's in Christ Jesus. And I give you instances of how redemption is talked about. So this can't be a, a reference to God who's the Redeemer. Uh -huh, yes. This is talking about deliverance, mm -hmm. overt deliverance. Now I said, let, let my name be upon them. Let them be in my lineage. See, if I want to trace the lineage there, actually they're in your lineage, Joseph. And you're in my lineage, but I'm, I'm, I'm adopting these boys so they're in my lineage, and we'll get the promise. Let my name be upon them. Yeah. And the name of my, my father is Abraham and Isaac, because the blessing is not going to extend beyond Jacob, which otherwise it didn't. It was Abraham, Isaac, Jacob. Mm -hmm. it, it, it stopped at that yeah. point. But here, the promise is conferred upon the sons of Joseph who took his who took his place. Mm -hmm. Aside from this uh, incident, a blessing was only pronounced upon a very few individuals. Mm -hmm. Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, they had blessed, several blessings pronounced upon them. But now Jacob is including Ephraim and Manasseh in this blessing. Now Joseph sees what's going on. He saw that his father laid his right hand upon the head of Ephraim. It displeased him. Mm -hmm. He held up his father's hand and removed it from Ephraim. This is not right, Joseph saw. Mm -hmm. Now first of all, I'd like to note how alert Joseph was. Yeah. Uh -huh. I, I know a lot of fathers that never would have seen this. Mm -hmm. It just would have passed right by him. Mm -hmm. They're not alert. And you have children, you got to be alert. Mm -hmm. yeah. so he, knows, he noticed what happened. Mm -hmm. And it displeased him when he saw it. Mm -hmm. Some versions say it, it did not seem right to him. Mm -hmm. He was upset. He thought it was a mistake. This is, mm -hmm. this is the way it should be. I'll, 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 I'll correct it, though. I'll, mm -hmm. My father's old and his vision's bad, so... I'll take it out of my, I'll do it. It was obvious Joseph took this serious. Yeah. Yes, he took it serious. Yeah. So he's, he's t he has taken hold of Jacob's hand and he's going to lift it up. He's going to transfer it over to Manasseh's head. Now there are times when the saints experience things that don't seem right. They, they don't think it's going to happen, but you be patient. <laughs> be patient. <laughs> don't come to premature judgment uh -huh. on it. But as he, his father, refused. Yeah. Like, oh, hell fast. No, oh, he wouldn't move his hand. Yeah. going to move that. His right hand's over here. No, he wouldn't. He refused. Mm -hmm. He said, I know it, my son. I know it. Uh -huh. <laughs> it was like a rebuke. I know it, my son. I know it. I know what I'm doing. In this matter, you know, Job said there's a spirit in man and the spirit of the Almighty giveth him understanding. Well, in this case, 
the Spirit of the Almighty gave Jacob understanding. Yes. Amen. So it was an inner like a voice saying, Amen. this is the way we're going. He said, no. cross your hands, Jacob. Yeah. Cross your hands. Lay your hand on, right hand on Manasseh, on Ephraim. Mm -hmm. I was thinking about this earlier when you mentioned that, that Joseph unwittingly he presented them. So he, he gave his father so to speak, what to work with. Uh -huh. And I was thinking sometimes sometimes the world gives the saints circumstances <laughs> to work with. This uh -huh. is what you have. Now work with it. That's right. And the Lord gives his people the ability to be creative That's right. to use what the Lord's given That's us right. uh -huh. and still be according to his purpose. That's right. Mm -hmm. just, Cross was, your hands. Right. I was uh -huh. intrigued by that. Yeah. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> Yeah. You gotta know when to cross your hands. You can see the diligence of both of these men. Joseph yes. is is thinks there's an heir happening, yeah. and he's gonna, even though it's his father, he's he's gonna honor God more than his father. He's yeah. gonna try to correct it, and then and yet Jacob, no, he he knows he's doing the Lord's will, Amen. and so he insists. He refused. I like yeah. that. Mm -hmm. That's the tenacity of faith. See, yeah. faith tightens the sinews of your muscles. Amen. Your spiritual muscles, so you'll not be deterred. He says, I know it, I know it, I know it. He said, now, don't worry, son. Manasseh, he's going to become a multitude, too. He's, a, he's not going to be like unblessed. He's just not getting this. He's not getting the patriarchal blessing. But he, he will be blessed. He'll, he'll become a people, and he also shall be great. So yeah, we're not, God's not ignoring him. Same kind of thing happened to Ishmael. Same yeah. thing happened to Ishmael. Oh, that Ishmael might live before they. No, no. He said, he did not be partaker of the inheritance. He said, but I'll, I'll bless, I'll bless Ishmael for your sake. I'll make a great nation. Kings will come out of him. So, Ishmael got a blessing, but not the main blessing. Yeah. See, the main thing is to get the main blessing, yes. the big blessing, Amen. the blessing that makes a difference yes. in your appearance before God. Two. I always think about um, whenever the children of Israel came into their inheritance, how the lots fell. Mm. Here you have God took Levi out for himself. Yeah, that's right. But it, this is where you get the the additional lots. So there would be twelve lots in in the land, and then Levi was dispersed amongst all of the the peoples. Because that was the Lord's portion. That's right. Mm -hmm. But there you there you have Ephraim and Manasseh taking the place of Levi. That's right. Amen. Mm -hmm. Two of the I'm going to bless him, but the younger shall be greater. Yes, but Jason. I find it a little curious here that Joseph didn't remember his own family yeah. history. This happened with every generation. I know. <laughs> you have a, you have Abraham has two sons. Yeah. The younger one gets the promise. Jacob himself yeah. is the younger. He gets the promise. I know. Mm -hmm. Now, there's a, I have a couple thoughts here. I've been thinking about on on blessing and election, and these are these are related thoughts. This this blessing that keeps getting mentioned again and again in every successive generation. Yeah. I, people today, I don't think they understand what this blessing means. We, we think of blessing as sort of like speaking a good word. Mm. God bless you. Let's bless the food. But that's not that's yeah. not what this is that's at right. all. No. Mm -hmm. uh, bl blessing here, the concept of blessing, it has to do with the promise of God. Amen. Amen. Right? Uh, or with divine activity and purpose, the blessing doesn't have to do with human intentions at all. Amen. Uh, it has to do with people participating in the divine purpose. Amen. This is this blessing is something that God is bestowing. Amen. Not man. So this Amen. isn't this isn't really Jacob's blessing. It's it's as if God is bestowing the blessing through through mm -hmm. Jacob. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And then a, a related concept with, uh, of election, this uh, idea of election, me it means the purpose of God does not depend on man. Mm -hmm. that's, what, that's what we're supposed to see with every successive generation. 
Yeah. Ishmael was the product of Abraham and Sarah. So he doesn't get the blessing. That's right. Man, whatever man produces, that's not the blessing. It has to come from God. Amen. So Isaac gets the blessing. Mm -hmm. Jacob and Esau come along. The younger, God said before they did anything, uh -huh. the younger, yeah. the older is going to serve the younger rather. But mm -hmm. Isaac loved Esau. Yeah. 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 Mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> But he saw it though. Remember, uh -huh. remember when after Jacob dressed up like his brother, yeah. uh -huh. and then Esau came yeah, in. Came Isaac him. knew what had happened. He said yeah. he came and took your blessing. That's right. Uh -huh. He knew it. So, so Isaac knew this was the will of God. Yes, mm -hmm. Amen. He saw it at that at, at that point. So it doesn't depend on man. It depends on Amen. God. Amen. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Here, here's another thing too. You don't see the, we don't have any record of the other sons bringing their children for the blessing. Yeah. None of, none of the other brothers that we know of brought brought their children to to their father yeah. mm -hmm. and asked for the blessing. Now, Joseph had been in Egypt, and his, his wife was taken from among the Egyptians. Mm -hmm. Joseph was very mindful of being back into the root of, of that family mm -hmm. and I, I've often uh, thought that perhaps him seeking the blessing of his father you know to make sure his sons were fully identified with Israel rather than being uh, identified with with the Egyptians yeah mm -hmm. amen mm -hmm. see um and in here, somewhere I, I have the text, Joseph took the place of the firstborn. And so because of that, this whole situation is critical now. Another thought on that too. Leah was not the wife of his love. And he, he took care of her. But she, she lived that whole time knowing that she wasn't. Yeah. She wasn't, the, you know, favored by Jacob. That she was there because her father gave her to him because she was the oldest. Mm. And now, jo and remember, Reuben he fell from the position of the firstborn yeah. son mm -hmm. by transgression. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But, but Joseph was the firstborn of uh, of the wife that he loved. That's right. Mm -hmm. Yes, and you amen. Think about the. The relation that the church has to the Lord, that that she's begotten of the son of his love, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and that this is that it's a little bit different relationship than the law had with the people. Mm -hmm. They're legitimate, but now whenever you talk about Jesus, it's a different kind of love mm -hmm. that yes. we're talking Amen. about. Mm -hmm. yeah. Amen. Now Jacob pronounced a blessing. It says. He set, he set Ephraim and Manasseh. Mm -hmm. That is, he changed the order. Yeah. Uh -huh. He said, God, God make thee as Ephraim mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and Manasseh. And until that time, they were always referred to as Manasseh and Ephraim. But he set a new order. Even before this, he said, Thy two sons, Manasseh and Ephraim. <laughs> when Abraham buried, was buried, Esau and Isaac buried him. And the record puts them in divinely defined order. And his sons, Isaac and Ishmael, <laughs> buried him. <laughs> see, see how particular these records are. The Chronicles also list them in that order. The sons of Abraham, Isaac, and Ishmael. 1 Chronicles 1.28. When referring to the sons of Isaac, Esau, and Jacob, the letter to the Hebrew believers reverses the birth order, having precedence to the divine order. It says, by faith Isaac blessed Jacob and Esau. So see, he reversed. <laughs> Otherwise, we're Esau and Jacob. Now, the ultimate... Uh, Progenitors among men are Adam yeah. and Christ. Yeah. Now, when it comes to order of birth, uh -huh. 
Adam was the first man, Jesus was the second man. But when it comes to priority, it all passes to Jesus. That's why these things are there, because of because of the nature of of salvation. Yes. Our birth, our second birth is the most important. That's right. Look, we got the new man, the old man. The new man really was last. Yeah. Uh huh. But in a divine economy, he's first. Yeah. And the last should be first. And it's pretty consistent. You, if you search through scripture, you'll find several instances like this. The last will be first, and the first will be last. That's right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Now, Israel said to Joseph, Behold, I die. I'm dying. See, one of the marvelous effects of faith is how a person approaches death. Yeah. Yes. Sometimes I hear uh, Christians, some of the young, younger Christians, speak about impending death, and they, they don't speak about it correctly. They speak of it more as a tragedy and, you know, but it, Jacob's right up front with Joseph. He said, "I'm dying. Mm -hmm. yeah. Behold, think about this. Don't try and don't try and blot this out of your mind. Uh -huh. I'm I'm dying." Yeah. Everyone must exit the body. Yes. Amen. The normal way is death. Uh -huh. If you're alive and remain of Jesus comes, then you're mm -hmm. changed in a moment, a twinkling of an eye. But everyone's has to exit the body, so it should not be treated mm -hmm. as a sort of a tragedy, trying to avoid it and things like this. It should, shouldn't be treated that way. Yeah. It's an appointment that can be met in faith, just, Amen. Like, Amen. just right. like he did. Uh -huh. So, well, That's right. Uh -huh. Amen. I die, but see, up to this time, all this blessing all depended on me. Abraham first, Isaac, then Jacob, all depended on me now. Now the, now the third patriarch is getting ready to die. Uh -huh. yeah. What's going to happen now to the blessing? God shall be with you. Yes, see? Yeah. He, what God had to work with, and I got these 12 sons. Uh -huh. and he's, got, he's got what he needs to work with to build a nation. God will be with you. See, God, Abraham had faithfully passed along, yes. just like God said he would. Uh -huh. You're going to inhabit this country. You'll be, a, you'll be in bondage and strange nation for 400 years, but you'll come out with great substance. You'll inherit land. That had been faithfully yes. passed along. All through the years, it's been passed along. Even though it'd be, God will be with you. See, God will be with you. And, and, get, and bring you again to the land. It was going to be well over 400 years before this happened. Mm -hmm. Why did he, why didn't he say, I just, just four centuries, mm -hmm. in four centuries this will happen, so be patient. But faith doesn't think in terms of time. Yeah, amen. Faith does not think in terms of time. So Jacob assures you're going into the land. Mm -hmm. You've got to, th this is how you've got to think. You know, they will all not get in, but 400 years later they'll get in. You don't even think that way. Don't think that way. And this application does apply to those in Christ. I have heard over the years, I can't more than I want to hear it, and I never want to hear it again. People say, from the first century, the believers all expected Jesus to return in their lifetime. They don't understand. That's not what they were saying. They were living in expectation of him coming. See, they were outside. They weren't talking in terms of time. Yeah. Uh -huh. mm -hmm. This is how faith is. You live every day yes. with this in mind, and faith transcends time. Yes. When you believe, you exit the domain of time. You're not in the domain of time yes. when you're, your faith isn't in there. So you're living if, just as though he's coming right in the next few minutes yeah. or minute. And you live in that. That's how faith reacts. Yes, amen. This is what Peter was saying when he said, With the Lord, a day is as a thousand right. years, and yeah. a thousand right. years is a day. Mm -hmm. Time's not a consideration. Human time. You can see that, can't you? Yeah. You've probably heard people make mm -hmm. this argument. But they don't understand the nature of the faith life. This is, they had to live knowing they personally 
wouldn't get in the land, but they lived in view that their, that their people would get in. We live suspecting that we personally may not personally be alive and remain when Jesus comes. But that doesn't change the way we live. We don't, this isn't how we think. Am I going to be here when Jesus comes? This isn't how we think. Yes. We think in view, up in the heavenlies, in view of yeah. Christ's coming. Those who are living by faith will recognize what I'm saying. Yeah. The others will just have to wait till they can. Perfect. Have a view. I'm going to be ready. Yes. That's right. When yeah. Jesus comes. That's mm -hmm. right. Now, I've given you one portion, he said, above your brethren. Mm -hmm. This land belonged to Joseph because of his right birthright. Uh -huh. yes. First Chronicles 5, 2 reads, mm -hmm. For Judah prevailed above his brethren, and of him came the chief ruler. But the birthright was Joseph's. He saw Joseph. Mm -hmm. he got, that's why he's going to get more. Now, he's going to spell out what he gave him, additionally what he gave him. Ezekiel also refers to this thing of Joseph getting more. Thus saith the Lord God, this shall be the border whereby ye shall inherit the land according to the twelve tribes of Israel. Joseph shall have two portions. See, that's the way. This was incorporated into the vocabulary and teaching of the Jews. Even the Gospels refer to this. Remember when Jesus met that woman at the well? He cometh into the city of Samaria, which is called Sychar, near to the parcel of ground that Joseph, that Jacob gave to his son Joseph. So there, there it is. It's a, this is a key point in Scripture. Right? When Joshua administered the land, lotted it out by portions, he reads, And Joshua spake unto the house of Joseph, who is that? Even to Ephraim and Manasseh. See the order there? saying, Thou art a great people, and so forth. Mm -hmm. So that's, that's the portion of land is, the, is what the Amorites had. Mm -hmm. Now in this text it says that Jacob took it of the hand of the Amorite with my sword and with my bow. Now the account of this is that there's not an account of this in Scripture. That doesn't mean it didn't happen, it's just it's, it's, that's not said. This plot of land is mentioned in the book of Joshua, this very plot of land we're talking about, that he gave to Joseph's, he gave to his sons. And the bones of Joseph, which the children of Israel brought up out of Egypt, buried they in Shechem in a parcel of ground which Jacob bought of the sons of Hamor, the father of Shechem, for a hundred pieces of silver, and it became the inheritance of the children of Jacob, uh, children of Joseph. So there. You see how consistent this is all, mm -hmm. all through Scripture? Yeah. So we don't know when or how he took the land. We don't need to. We know this is what he did because this was written hundreds of years after Jacob. The Holy Spirit revealed this to Moses. So there's, there's no question about this being what he did. Because mm -hmm. yeah. hundreds of years later, the Holy Spirit reveals to Moses, write this down, mm -hmm. that Jacob took it with the bow and the sword. So it is true. Mm -hmm. Amen. I wanted to, before I close, mention the danger of a, a religion of generalities. You've surely been impressed as we've gone through this of the particulars that's everywhere in these records. It's, it's very particular. Everything's very particular. No generalization. I don't, I don't want to dwell on this subject, but... To me, the landscape of Christianity has too many generalities in it. Even though salvation is very specific, very detailed, people have been led to think of it in very general terms. God loves everybody. God doesn't want anybody. God, it's very general. Salvation is not general. It's very specific. At the, shall I say, at the highest, at the highest level. General, by definition, means not confined by specialization or, care, or careful limitation. That's the, defin the official definition of general. So salvation is bounded by divine purpose and so forth. 
so it's not general. So it's good to learn to speak specifically. If you talk about God blessing, particularize this sort of thing. The working of the Lord is thus far in Genesis is loaded with p particular things, specific things, but specific people, specific times, specific places. See, just it's everywhere, everywhere we've gone so far, we've seen this. I'm going to close there. It, any of you would like to add anything tonight, Sister Barb? I think there's a great advantage for the person who is entering the time of passing to be sober-minded and know what is happening. Mm -hmm. Yes. There's, yes. Uh, there's a grace that's given in that time that is very needed for the person to know that they are entering into the time of passing so that they can prepare themselves. Mm -hmm. They can, like you mentioned about Jacob, mm -hmm. he was... He was finishing up the things that he had to do here in the earth, and he was turning his expectation then to the things that were to come. And I know that there have been times here in the earth when people have passed that they have expected the Lord to heal them and continue living on here in the earth mm -hmm, mm -hmm. instead of being sober-minded about a time of passing. Mm -hmm. And so I think, um, I think that it's lacking in our culture today, a sober-mindedness about death. Yes, amen. amen. Good word. Amen. Leah? Jacob was the youngest and he got the blessing. And this was the same thing with Ephraim and Manasseh. That's right. Mm -hmm. Amen. It's very important to get the blessing. Mm -hmm. Amen. Brother Ricky? Yeah, I'm thankful for the meticulous detail of Jacob with regard to who is in. Well, I know this is God superseding the whole thing. Yeah particular about who's in the beginnings of the race of this people mm -hmm. who are going to be the people of God. Yeah. Because that is exactly how God has been with Christ Jesus. Amen. Very meticulous. Our beginnings are traced back to Jesus. He's the Father. Mm -hmm. Everlasting Father. And so we've come from a good root. And so I, that was just an, a, a wonderful ministry to see. Look at the trouble that was caused by what happened to Adam. Mm -hmm. We were all impacted by this, who yes. so became a bad mm -hmm. group. Mm -hmm. But look at the good things that have come because God has been very careful with, with this second man. Mm -hmm. You know, he's the he's the olive root from which we've all come, and so we are we're very thankful for that kind of detail that is associated with what we would become. As yes, a amen, mm -hmm. amen. And you know, Abraham was faithful to pass along what God told yes. him to Isaac, and Isaac to Jacob, and. And then God, they had these assumptions in life, so God comes along, He confirms the truth of these things, He impresses the truth of these things on, and their they don't, and, and what happens to them in their events in life, and, and so it, so they, they see it as the truth, they, you know, God is teaching them the truth of it, and they're able to pass this along. It's, it's quite astounding. Amen. They, they God came right along, and he, he, he just lived it out in them too. So each one of them was an example of of what God had actually promised. And something else, too, about the Amplified uh, version there. And that's aggravating. Uh, <laughs> yes, I, I've read the Amplified, but, you know, now they they uh, purposely interjected what they thought mm -hmm. in that verse there. But uh, they thought it meant. Yeah, yeah. Not I mean, that said, was but they thought it meant. flagrant injection there. Mm -hmm. And so that's, that's real aggravating. That's why it's dangerous to be reading these kind of... Uh, now, I, I like to amplify it from time to time. But that's what, but it's dangerous to read these kind of things yeah. because you never know mm -hmm. when they try to slip something in on you. Yeah, you have to know how to handle the truth. Yeah, yeah. and uh, I, I didn't know it. I never recognized it before either. But King James has that word "angel" capitalized. Yeah, I don't know why, but uh, yeah. Yes, it's several words. Several words. Yeah. yeah. It just struck me during our um, lesson tonight. Of God's desire to be known, of uh, and That's to have right. fellowship. I mean, He's went to a great deal, a great work, all this time. You think about all the passing of time and all the people and the blessings that were passed, and this blessing that's being passed. He only passed it to the ones that were going to be able to receive the blessing, That's right. because they were going to have to um, fulfill His purpose in, in doing these things. But um, He's making us to be like Himself. And we will be able to see him and the fellowship with him 
So this is the blessing that's being passed on to us. Yes, right. And it's a mighty work because it's mm -hmm. taken a lot of time, even though Amen. to God Amen. time is nothing, but to us it's been a long time. And what occurs in Christ, because we're called into the fellowship of God's dear son, but these patriarchs, they didn't have fellowship with God. He just, in a whole lifetime, maybe four or five encounters with God was about it. And the prophets, they would have some, but they didn't live like with a daily, yeah. uh -huh. daily. They could, they could, when God talked to them, they go, I was by the river of Kibar. You know, they could, yeah. they could specify the place. But now that sin's been done away, yeah. what they experienced periodically, mm. we can experience consistently. And that's what you're talking about. Yeah. Right? Just that's to get right. to that point. But it was, it was illustrated, yeah. this is possible, it was illustrated in them. Yes, the Lord's working is always disruptive to nature. That's right. And according to nature, the, the firstborn mm -hmm. is the is the heir. And even more than disruptive, it it can overturn nature. Amen. He, you know, like Amen. Abraham and Sarah. That was a, he was overturning nature. Yeah. And in you know, in so many so many different ways. A lot of examples come come to mind, you know, like he he, he took Joseph from from being a prisoner to being a ruler. That's yeah. it. It's, it's, it doesn't happen. <laughs> That's right. And in the case of the apostles, you know, the people were, the religious people, they were like, how did how did they learn this? They took note that they'd been with Jesus because mm -hmm. it, it just wasn't, that just wasn't the way things work for fishermen to be, to be doing and saying and knowing and, and understanding the things, the mm -hmm. things that they do mm -hmm. or that they did. Um, but that, when, when nature confronts divinity, nature is always disrupted. Mm -hmm. yeah. and, but that, in a, in a principal way, that's actually what's happening in redemption. Amen. Is that he's, Amen. he's actually extracting men. He's, he's extracting us from, from nature. Yes. Mm -hmm. And it, it's, it's not just a novelty. It's right. that we're the, uh, that overturning or that clash is actually uh, preparing us and, and fitting mm -hmm. us for the, for the world for the world to come, Amen. and so when we when we exit the world, then we'll actually be we'll, we'll be ready, we'll be suitable, mm -hmm. be yes. we'll be usable, yes. Amen. we'll be we'll be uh, productive. We won't mm -hmm. won't be see we're out of place here, but we'll be in place there. Yeah. Amen. Yes, Peter. Looking at this, uh, what you've already expanded on. That God <clears throat> created the patriarchs, and He created their children, and He determined when each one would be born. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So God was even governing that in mm -hmm. in the flesh, and yet by choosing its blessing to be particularly on the unexpected ones, <laughs> He's showing that yeah. that there, while God governs what is done and what is seen, even more so. God is overseeing that which is spiritual, which is unseen. Mm -hmm. And he's showing what it means to be a firstborn to him. Mm -hmm. That no one would put confidence in the flesh or begin to esteem themselves of somehow mm -hmm. being innately worthy mm -hmm. of the blessing of God. But that God's blessing is always given intentionally mm -hmm. by him. And mm -hmm. it is a gift. Amen. Mm -hmm. Amen. Amen. Yes. Mm -hmm. Mm. All right, we'll have a word of prayer. Our dear Heavenly Father, we thank and praise Thee for the nature of salvation mm -hmm. and for the various ways You've demonstrated how You work. It's refreshing to our spirit. It's awakened hope and faith within us. And we confess, Father, that we do desire mm -hmm. to know what You have revealed and to walk with you, to live for you. We thank you that you've given us the grace to do so. Mm -hmm. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 amen.